What I'm going to be talking about now is uh, sort of looking at the other end of the disease spectrum, looking specifically at the aftershocks, the effects of disease, the impact of mortality on the structure of society. I was just reading uh, in, I think it was Time or Newsweek magazine there, they were talking about the uh, possible outbreak of an epidemic from the Asian flu virus. And it said, the article claimed that the, would result in the loss of 2.5% of the world's population. And that 2.5% is a rate of mortality is enough to bring down a government or even an entire civilization. Well, I don't know if that's true, but what we're looking at in the case of the Black Death, the plague in the 14th and 15th centuries, is a loss of population on the order of between 30 and 50 percent. So we're looking at uh, huge, huge losses of population. And uh, this had very, very serious repercussions throughout Europe and the Middle East. I specifically look at England and Egypt uh, as case studies. And I'm really going to talk more about Egypt here. Now, uh, the Egypt was an extremely wealthy country uh, at the dawn of the 14th century. What you can see here, what I threw up here for the PowerPoint overheads, are images of the fertile areas of Egypt, Egypt from space. Uh, we have uh, a picture here of the green areas of Egypt watered by the Nile that uh, are, of course, the only really habitable areas of Egypt. And um, why is Egypt's agrarian sector, was Egypt's agrarian sector so rich? This gets us basically down to understanding of the Nile floods, which many of you are already familiar with. But I'm going to run through the basic outline of the Nile flood. Egypt's irrigation system at its best could support a population, uh, a medieval population of some 10 million, and probably had a population of around six million before it was hit by the Black Death. Oh, these, I'm just going to scroll through these. These are images of the ruins of Egypt and its halcyon days gone by. All right, uh, Egypt's Nile flood comes from the monsoon striking Ethiopia uh, in the very early summer. So what you have is a wave of intense moisture striking the highlands of Ethiopia coming from the Indian Ocean circling this way uh, and leaving a, an enormous amount of water in the rivers of Ethiopia. And what this does is to swell one particular branch feeding into the Nile. And that is uh, the branch of the Nile that, where the, br the Blue Nile coming from Ethiopia strikes the White Nile. And the Blue Nile is flooded by the intense rains in Ethiopia. Uh, and that subsequently floods and uh, raises the level of the Nile River. And here we can see on a chart the rise in the level of the Nile River taking place uh, in, uh, in June, July, and then hitting its peak in August and early September. And all of that is coming from the monsoons hitting Ethiopia. So this results in massive flooding of the Nile. Uh, and um, the main branch of the Nile rises rapidly, and upper and lower Egypt are flooded. And the flooding of the Nile is measured, was measured uh, in the 14th century by an interesting device called the Nilometer. The Nilometer was a measuring device that was used to uh, locate the exact level of the Nile flood. What you had is channels leading from the Nile River into a well in which you had a measuring pillar. So let's take, I have a few images of this. Let's take a look at this. 
Uh, here we see the, one of the conduits leading into the square well with flooded water. Uh, and here we can see a cross section of this measuring well uh, as uh, it um, records the level of the Nile flood. Okay, so you can see here the channels that lead into the square well leading from the river into this well which is measuring the level of the Nile. You have three channels leading in here uh, that uh, will measure the level of the Nile at any level of flood or minimum. This, by the way, was my favorite tourist site when I was in Egypt. Uh, most of the people coming to Egypt are interested in seeing the pyramids. And then a small percentage of those coming to Egypt are willing to look at monuments from the medieval period. And then uh, a very, very small percentage, uh, just me, were interested in looking at this uh, fascinating structure, the nilometer. So I have some more images of it here just to give you an idea of how it was structured. Another image of the nilometer showing the uh, measuring pillar with the flood, the channels coming in from the flood. And this is just a picture from above, a picture of the nilometer from above. Another just to give you an idea of how it works. I encourage you to visit it if you go to Egypt. And uh, just a drawing of the Nile flood officially being visited uh, in the late medieval period. Uh, this was very, very important to uh, Egyptian, the Egyptian economy, critical to the Egyptian economy, because the level on the Nilometer lets you know whether or not you were going to get a fertile harvest or whether or not you were going to have a famine. Uh, generally speaking, the Nile was actually fairly forgiving as the irrigation system worked fairly efficiently the Nile, the um, irrigation system could handle different levels of flood uh, in, uh, in the uh, early fall. So you had a range of flood levels, uh, of maximum flood levels that you would see in September. And they were closely watched, very, very closely watched by uh, observers, by the government of Egypt, by the rulers of Egypt, to see whether or not you would actually have a full flooding of Egypt's irrigation system. And the trick was that if the level of the Nile was too low, which didn't happen very often, but if it happened, if the level of the Nile was too low, you weren't going to get a sufficient watering of the irrigation system for the winter crop in wheat, barley, and, chick and broad beans. But on the other hand, if it were too high, if it were to be too high, uh, you would also have a problem in that you would have water logging of the soil, of the seeds, and you could also get a famine resulting from that. And both problems occurred uh, probably at about a rate of once in every 50 years you would get a level of the Nile that was either disastrously low or disastrously high. So the level of the Nile was always watched very carefully by the uh, Egyptians. And they had a, a wafa a Nil, which was a celebration of the attainment of the level of the Nile to its ideal height. So this was very central to the Egyptian economy. Uh, and uh, we can see here in this diagram a basic schematic of the irrigation system. Uh, and what you can see, well, I'll come back to this. What you can see here uh, are the main channels leading away from the Nile or an even larger canal leading into a crisscrossing of canals that were watering these fields depicted here. The basic system worked to let water into the basins. Water was led into the basins, and uh, you had a system of dikes and canals that contained water for 
somewhere between 40 and 50 days after the maximum rise of the Nile contained water in the basins. And here we have the drawings of a 19th century observer who uh, did a study of Upper Egypt before you had the impact of perennial irrigation, that is the setting up of dams and continuous watering of the lands throughout the year. Uh, this observer was able to actually go and do a study of the way that the Nile irrigation system worked before you had any dams there. Of course, now they have the enormous Aswan Dam, and they have different uh, uh, challenges to face these days. But uh, this is what the system basically looked like. You would have a Nile River canal leading off uh, into basins with these are dikes that held the water once it was let into the basins uh, with basically mud and masonry serving as the structure of the dikes. I have some images here that I don't think really came out that well. Uh, no, they certainly didn't. Um, let me try the silver one. Um, well, OK, just gives you sort of a rough idea here of uh, canals leading off uh, into large basins that are depicted here, uh, large basins that were subsequently flooded with water up to a depth of about one meter. Uh, and also, very importantly, because the flooding was coming from the Blue Nile in Ethiopia, what you had was a massive amount of soil being washed down from Ethiopia. So you had a layer of alluvium that uh, settled on the ground, the watered basins. Uh, and this layer of alluvium provided a rich fertilizer for the winter crop. So one of the things that distinguished Egypt as an agricultural country in the medieval period from other medieval societies is that they did not need to leave lands fallow or use fertilizer. They had this gift of the Nile, which would provide them with fertilizer each and every year, fertilizer sweeping down from Ethiopia. Uh, and this was a tremendous advantage for Egypt's crops and meant that you had an enormous uh, output coming from what was really a rather small area. I mean, obviously, if you look at, you see Egypt on a map, you see a large area. But the fertile area of Egypt was only confined uh, to the Nile Valley and the Delta but it could support a huge population. So the uh, irrigation system uh, was set up to uh, allow the water into these basins. And then uh, at the end of the season, after 40 or 50 days, in late October and early November, the water was drained away from these basins, which was also important uh, for allowing for a a uh, sufficient amount of water without waterlogging the basins. It was led out of these basins and back into the Nile or a main canal. One of the important distinctions, which I'll refer to uh, later here, uh, is that you had a system of very large canal systems uh, and large dikes that were called the Sultanic Canal System. And then you also had on a much more local level for an individual village, you would have what was called the Baladi system, uh, in which uh, you had much smaller irrigation canals and dikes flooding uh, basins on a village level. So all of this was of great promise for Egypt uh, and was a highly efficient system that supported uh, an unprecedented level of population uh, and population density for the medieval period. But then the plague arrived in Egypt, uh, and things went through dramatic changes. Uh, this is just uh, a 14th century account of the plague's arrival on a ship uh, arriving into the port of Alexandria with most of the people dead or dying. Now, sometimes someone might look at a story like this and say, well, clearly, the author is exaggerating or the author is punctuating his narrative with exciting details to attract his audience. 
Uh, perhaps this is just a literary topos. But if you consider the situation in the Mediterranean when the Black Death arrived in 1347 and 1348, this story, this story about a ship arriving at the port, at a major port, a ghost ship full of dead and dying people, was repeated throughout the Mediterranean. It was repeated throughout the Mediterranean. Uh, you find sources describing the arrival of ships uh, in Sicily, in southern Italy, and in the south of France. And you have the same kind of description, essentially ghost ships drifting into ports full of dead bodies, uh, corpses that were left from the ravages of the Black Death as they journeyed from uh, our point of origin for Europe and the Middle East, which was Crimea on the Black Sea and then Constantinople. Now, I want to make some notes here real quick about the socioeconomic and political system of Egypt as it existed in the early 14th century. It was called the Mamluk system, and the country is called Mamluk Egypt. Mamluk uh, in Arabic means basically it means slave or owned by another person. Mamluk Egypt was a, a, had a political system whereby non-Muslims were uh, purchased as slaves from, mainly from the Caucasus uh, in this period and brought in to uh, serve as soldiers. They were converted to Islam uh, and they were trained in the highly efficient uh, and difficult uh, military tactics of using the composite bow and horse and horses, uh, the kind of highly efficient military tactics that actually successfully defeated the Mongols, uh, uh, one of the rare defeats of the Mongols during the period of their invasion in the 1200s. Uh, what's important about this system is that the Mamluks, these quote unquote slaves actually ruled Egypt. They had taken power in the 13th century and they ruled Egypt and they held land holdings. They owned all of the land in Egypt. Uh, and they held land holdings, but what's important uh, about these land holdings is that they were scattered and held for short periods of time. So in different parts of Egypt, you would have scattered holdings for one particular landholder. Um, an individual landholder might own part of a village in the northern delta, uh, and then another part of the village in the southern delta, and yet another part of a village uh, in the Nile Valley. And it would hold these villages or these pieces of villages and lands for short periods of time. When referring to a comparison, a contrast with Europe, this was important because uh, it meant that they didn't have a direct economic, microeconomic investment uh, in the output and the maintenance of their estates. They were relatively detached from the functioning of their estates. They rarely actually lived on any of their estates. Uh, and Egypt's irrigation system itself was manned by Coptic Christians that acted as a conduit, a rural urban bureaucracy that was in charge of gathering the revenue from Egypt's rich agrarian villages. This had important consequences. In Europe, what you had essentially uh, in the main was a few, obviously a feudal system, but one in which landholders, landlords, I should say, uh, owned land uh, on a hereditary basis uh, in one particular location. Uh, and were very attached to the microeconomic health of their individual estates. So these had important, this socioeconomic structure uh, had very important repercussions for the outcome from a massive level of depopulation. So looking at the uh, impact of depopulation, uh, what it meant was that uh, you now had a particular village with only 50% of its population left. And this meant that uh, peasants had to work harder just to keep the same level of irrigation going. And uh, in many cases, in most cases, 
it meant that many parts of the local irrigation system began to fall apart. Uh, landlords, however, demanded the same amount of revenue, not surprisingly uh, for uh, any landlord during this period. They demanded that the revenue from the villages remain the same. So what happened was that uh, the Coptic Christian bureaucracy uh, and their agents within the village system would demand exactly the same amount of revenue regardless of what damage had taken place in the irrigation system. And this led to an important effect which was uh, an effective increase uh, in the overall level of rent or the amount of the crop, the surplus extraction that was drawn away from the peasantry. Uh, and this was a very, very important uh, outcome of the dynamics of mortality and the socioeconomic system. What you had taking place in Europe at the same time was that landlords were looking at the individual health of their estates and they were being forced to actually lower rents because peasants were leaving areas uh, that were not economically viable and regrouping in other areas in which landlords offered incentives, offered uh, lower levels of rents and higher wages. But because uh, Egypt's landholders were so removed from the uh, individual health of agrarian villages, it meant that uh, they were able to raise rents without a clear idea of how this was affecting the economy of Egypt. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that in Europe, and particularly in Western Europe, landlords were judicious uh, economic planners for the health of their country uh, at large. Nothing could be further than the case. They made numerous attempts to try to keep rents uh, up and wages down. Uh, and it was only because of their particular microeconomic disposition that they rather blindly uh, lowered rents and, uh, uh, and increased wages and attracted uh, peasants to more fertile areas of the devastated, uh, plague-ridden countryside. So uh, the local balladi uh, irrigation systems began to fall apart. Uh, and the larger irrigation network, the Sultanic system, and I'm just using this canal here as an example of a larger Sultanic system that would link Baladi canals together, Baladi canals and dikes together. Uh, this could also, this main canal could also serve as an example of the larger Sultanic system, or even this could serve as an example of a large canal feeding the individual networks that went to the smaller local village balladi systems. This larger system uh, very disastrously began to decay. Uh, it was uh, supposed to be supervised by the landholders. This system had worked very efficiently in the past, but under the stress of depopulation and facing decreasing revenues, despite the best efforts on the part of the landholders to keep the rents up, facing decreased revenues, the landholders, the managers of the larger irrigation network began to neglect repairs. And once this neglect of, of uh, repairs took on, uh, it, it took on a life of its own uh, because once uh, repairs were neglected for, say, a period of 10 to 20 years, it became an enormous task to try to actually repair them. And lacking incentives to make these repairs uh, with a drive for more and more revenue uh, for, sorry, to maintain the same revenue uh, and uh, a, uh, a tendency to divert funds away from the large irrigation network, this system began to fall apart with disastrous outcome for the uh, medieval Egyptian economy. And here we can see just a few uh, snapshots here of the system as it began to decay. I have here marked down various decaying basins and you can see the connections slowly starting to slip here, the connections between the individual villages and the actual uh, irrigation system within the villages themselves. 
Uh, here's another uh, picture looking slightly down the road uh, at what happened when canals were going dry, they were becoming over flooded, they were falling apart, uh, and you can see the decaying basins, the abandoned basins, the wreck of Egypt's irrigation system. So the problems with the socioeconomic system combined with mortality led to a devastating outcome. Uh, as the irrigation system collapsed both on a local level and much more importantly on a larger level, uh, what you would see is that many areas, uh, in many areas of the irrigation system, you would have the parching, the drying of lands, they weren't sufficiently watered. And in many other areas of the irrigation system, you would get levels of water that would sweep into the basins and they wouldn't be drained out again. Uh, you had insufficient systems of draining, uh, systems of draining that had broken down. And so you get either parching or water logging of the basins uh, and there was a massive failure of crops uh, due to this problem. On the nilometer, uh, what was registered were wild fluctuations in the level of the Nile that seemed to come from nature, but also, but, but actually had to do with the failure, failure of the larger sultanic irrigation system. Uh, this is just one of the many references that you have uh, in the sources that refer to the problems in maintaining the irrigation system. Uh, trying to deal with this problem and uh, mandate repairs uh, in the irrigation system, which the central government was simply not equipped to enforce. This is a typical diagram of the marginal product of labor, simply measuring the change in total output per unit of labor. Um, and this is what you had happening in a lot of parts of Europe. Uh, you had, um, I'm sorry, this is what happened in the medieval period uh, before the Black Death in a lot of parts of Europe, the efficiency of labor went down essentially because uh, as in the case of a place like England, you had relative overpopulation uh, and you had more labor than you actually needed on a piece of land. But when the Black Death hit, uh, you had a reverse in the level of population and the efficiency of labor went back up. So output went down in many areas of Europe but uh, the labor redistribution meant that you had a more efficient use of resources and actually that the survivors uh, were better off than they had been before the plague. So the plague was a blessing in disguise for some of these uh, economic systems. As you had redistribution of labor, people actually uh, were enjoying a greater output per capita uh, and the 15th century, uh, particularly in England, is sometimes uh, called the golden age of the peasantry, when peasants were able to enjoy a much greater level of output from their villages. Uh, if we look at this diagram as a whole, what you can see is gains to efficiency here as the population goes down. But what we have in Egypt is a very different picture. Because labor was not redistributed, uh, redistributed in a very efficient way, uh, because many of the peasants fled to cities, particularly Cairo, uh, as they were terrified by the uh, uh, incessant waves of epidemics sweeping through their villages and the slow decay of the irrigation system they did not resettle the land in an efficient way. The, the best kind of solution that one could have imagined for Egypt would be to have labor uh, resettle on lands that were least affected by the decay of the system. So if you can imagine half of the system collapsing over here and peasants fleeing to an area where the irrigation system was still functioning somewhat efficiently, that would be an opt optimal solution. That did not happen. Uh, because of uh, the um, because of the persecution, the uh, repression, I should say, of peasants uh, in the countryside, they largely fled to the cities, or sometimes they uh, would stay in one village. They would stick it out in their old collapsing village uh, and try to resort to 
means of sustenance using millet and sorghum and waterfowl and fish uh, that uh, operated a little bit better with the irrigation system falling apart. So this lack of inter-rural uh, mobility uh, and urban to rural, sorry, rural to urban flight meant that you actually witnessed uh, a decrease in the efficiency of labor as the population went down. So you had an overall decrease uh, in the total output, the gross domestic product of Egypt's agrarian system, but this did not lead to a benefit for the survivors. The collapse of the irrigation system uh, meant that uh, those who survived were actually uh, enjoying uh, a, they were actually uh, suffering from uh, a far lower level of output per capita. And this just uh, is an estimate of the level of uh, output measured in uh, units of grain before the impact of the plagues and after the impact of the plagues using various uh, medieval sources. This is what I've cobbled together as an image of uh, the total decrease uh, in output. And just as importantly, uh, very importantly, that is the decrease in output per capita uh, and the rise in prices because of this. Uh, and the uh, dramatic drop in wages because of this. Now let me, uh, this is like I said, the opposite happened in uh, Europe. And what we come out of this, uh, it, what we get coming out of this is a picture of how different socioeconomic structures uh, entailed a very different response to a high level of mortality. I'd like to finish this up by talking briefly about the Black Death as disease. I'm not a historian of disease uh, in particular, um, but I'd like to talk just very briefly uh, about the way in which the disease actually developed and became so lethal. Or that is uh, a theory uh, that uh, I have and uh, have studied through some sources about why the Black Death um, why the plague was so particularly lethal at that point in history. Uh, the the um, Black Death, sorry, they should say the plague was no stranger to the Mediterranean area. It had struck in the 500s AD, the 600s AD, and the 700s AD, and it becomes somewhat endemic to the Mediterranean area. So you have uh, a disease that was lingering in the Mediterranean region. And I might ask you, based on what John Schneider was telling us, what uh, does it mean when we have a disease that is endemic as opposed to epidemic? What does that say about R naught? Remember R naught, which is equal to K times P times D? Yes? It's, it's yeah, essentially equal to one, uh, essentially equal to one. So you have a disease that is being transmitted, but you don't have an explosion in the number of people uh, that are sick or transmitting the disease, nor do you have a rapid decrease in which the disease is dying off. So you have a kind of lingering disease that is there uh, in the Mediterranean region. So why do you get this sudden explosion of disease uh, in the 14th century? Why did that happen? Well, one of the theories is that you actually had an isolated reservoir of the, the bacteria that causes the Black Death, that is Yersinia pestis, an isolated reservoir somewhere uh, in either Central Asia uh, or Far East Asia, uh, a reservoir in which the disease was mainly spread back and forth between rodents, which of course are the secondary or the primary carrier of the, the fleas and the rodents interaction being the primary carrier of the disease. What this meant was you had uh, pockets uh, places that were isolated, isolated from uh, Homo sapiens, uh, where the disease evolved and mutated over time. Now, this just gets us down to a basic question of uh, disease interaction with Homo sapiens. I, I would ask, and this is based really, again, on what John Schneider was talking about, what makes a disease really successful? What is the ultimate success story for a disease uh, in our times, what is the most successful disease you can think of? 
a real winner of diseases. Um, what would, yes? Uh, one that can be spread easily. Yes, that would be part of it. One that can be spread easily. Uh, what, what would you think of as an example of a successful disease? That's the perfect example. That's the best example of a successful disease. It's easily spread, uh, and it hangs around duration for long enough uh, that uh, it can be spread to other people. But what else about the common cold makes it so successful a disease? If you're going to be a virus or bacteria, why would you want to be the common cold? What? Yes? Well, it mutates, and you, gets, you get lots of different types of cold. So that's another reason. Well, what, yes? That's a very, very important reason. It doesn't kill the host. Uh, the common cold, obviously, is very annoying. But it, in a very, very large percentage of cases, it never kills the host. And furthermore, it doesn't even really disable the host. The host will come into work the next day and go coughing and sneezing around and spread it to other people. Yes? I'm reminded of, I think it was Dr. Schneider, when he did why Ebola wasn't as uh, virulent because people died. Right? Unsuccessful, we could say, less so than virulent, because you could say the common cold is virulent. But yes, actually, that's a perfect example. And, and I, that's the one I wanted to come to. Ebola has the ultimate loser um, because, as a disease because uh, it kills all of its victims. Uh, it rages through a particular region like a wildfire, but then uh, it, it kills people off at such a rapid rate that the disease itself is killed off. So it commits suicide, essentially, as a disease, as an organism. Uh, whereas the common cold adapting itself to Homo sapiens uh, lives a robust life uh, in the community of humans. Uh, the idea here is that the, the strain of Yersinia pestis that was endemic to the Mediterranean region uh, and wasn't flaring up as a plague between the years, say, of 700 and 1400 was actually had to some extent adapted itself to human beings so that it was certainly not as friendly as the common cold, but it was uh, friendlier to human beings. But the idea uh, on the other side is that you have a disease which is isolated from humans. Now, naturally, this undergoes changes and mutations over time, but these mutations are no longer related to any kind of adaptation to the body of uh, any Homo sapiens. They're adapting, the, the disease is adapting itself to working efficiently through the nexus of rats and fleas, but there's no uh, adaptation to uh, ho the population of Homo sapiens. And actually, what it is doing, for lack of a better word, is evolving away from uh, a kind of, any kind of rough sort of symbiosis with humans. It's evolving away from that, and it is becoming. Uh, a much more lethal disease. It is becoming a loser in terms of diseases. Uh, it is becoming a disease that will rage like a wildfire and uh, kill its host in rapid numbers and then to a certain extent uh, snuff itself out. And this is why you s this uh, isolated uh, nexus of bacteria eventually, uh, and one of the ideas is through the Mongol trade routes, uh, spread from this area where it had been isolated and swept uh, east to China in the 14th century and west uh, to Europe and the Middle East with devastating consequences, rendered as a mutation, as a mutation of Yersinia pestis, so lethal because uh, it had spent so much time in isolation. This is one of many theories of the origin of the lethality of the Black Death in the 14th and 15th centuries. So this is one of the things we're seeing both in Europe and in England, which, with, which had, as I'm mentioning here, very different outcomes depending on the socioeconomic structure. So I'd like to leave it open for questions now. Um, it's not really a question, but I would just like um, to have you expound on something that I saw. The, the history of the um, socioeconomic uh, destruction of the of the irrigation systems and the ramifications behind that seems a little similar to the 
the recent um, tragedy we had as far as the uh, Katrina victims and the whole situ situation. Would you care to expound on that, like the similarities? Or do you see any similarities between that and what happened back in the med um, medieval times? It's a great analogy. I hadn't thought of that, but that's a really good analogy. Uh, I think uh, a system striking um, socioeconomic structure like that, a political structure uh, in Louisiana, in New Orleans, uh, you don't have uh, a reaction which is driven necessarily by blind market forces coming into play at first, but you have a more of a top-down reaction coming from uh, FEMA and the, uh, um, the structure of social services. Uh, and basically, for lots of different reasons um, where uh, public opinion uh, has different things to say, uh, you had a disastrously slow and inefficient response from the, uh, from the federal uh, agencies that were supposed to, and the local agencies that were supposed to take care of the situation. Uh, and uh, you had a rapidly escalating disastrous consequence. Uh, in terms of the actual socioeconomic structure, basically look at inefficiencies uh, that uh, were present right after the impact of a uh, plague in one case or hurricane in the other. And these kind of structural inefficiencies can lead to uh, enormous, enormous consequences that could have potentially been avoided, uh, in, as in the case with Katrina. Uh, certainly, uh, it's, it's difficult to go back to the medieval period and say, well, uh, they should have known what they were doing. They should have come up with a solution to the problem. Actually, there were uh, scholars at the time who were writing about this problem. Um, the, uh, the scholars wrote about it at the time. Scholars wrote about it. They said, look, the irrigation system is collapsing around us. We have to do something about this. This is devastating. It's been going on for a long time. We have to repair the canals and dikes. But the system did not respond uh, to uh, this kind of input because it was not structured in a way in which you had uh, a really highly effective authority that was going to come in, tell people what to do, and put them into their proper positions. So you might say it's a little bit different. Well, you, know, you can really draw a parallel, too, here with overlapping levels of authority and management uh, in the system uh, in New Orleans, which uh, was not responding well to the disaster of Katrina. And it's the, sc the scattered land holdings and the fact that they're held for a short period of time. And could you explain why that is? I, I just didn't really get that out. The problem comes down to a lack of a direct economic tie between the landholder and his estate. Uh, and the fact that you had this amorphous Coptic Christian bureaucracy that was managing the system. So what a landholder would do in the case of the Mamluk system in Egypt is demand restitution for his estates, not actually look at the estates uh, and see that peasants are fleeing from the estates and uh, eventually give in to this pressure of raising wages or lowering rents. Uh, instead, there was simply a, a very strong armed demand for uh, the same level of revenue coming from these estates and the, uh, the bureaucracy and then the local enforcers on the village level responded to this by keeping wages constant, keeping rents constant, in effect from the peasant's point of view, raising the surplus of extraction. Uh, and the contrast here uh, between this uh, economically um, uh, disinterested, uh, well, I should say very interested, but microeconomically detached from the estate, this type of landholder, in the Mamluk system, the real contrast that you get, um, especially in the case of England and other parts of Europe, uh, are feudal lords that actually had, in the main, this is not completely true in all cases, but they had uh, one estate that they were managing directly where they could see on the ground, they were far more rurally oriented, they could see on the ground the exact impact of trying to keep wages low uh, and rents high. And they could see peasants fleeing away from their estates and blindly, I say, because they didn't do this as any kind of plan, uh, landlords in different parts of Europe and England began 
to lower wages, uh, sorry, raise wages and um, decrease rents and provide incentives for peasants to relocate to their uh, individual land holdings. And what this meant is that you had a drift of population to concentrate itself around the remaining areas which uh, could be irrigated, which could be uh, uh, agriculturally worked in. And particularly, you had a drift away from marginal land areas. Europe, arguably, uh, before the plagues, was overpopulated, given the level of uh, agrarian technology at the time. And in fact, uh, it was so overpopulated, relatively speaking, that uh, it was the forests were largely cut down. And you actually have more forest in Europe in present day than you did in Europe prior to the Black Death. Uh, so you had a flight away from these marginal lands into the most efficient lands remaining uh, under the plow. And this led to a higher output per capita, not a higher output after the Black Death. The output did go down in Europe, but per capita. The government was really paralyzed in its response. It didn't have a clear idea of where to go. Uh, there was certainly no notion at the time, although it developed later in the Middle East, of a quarantine being applied. What you had uh, on a much lesser scale than you did uh, in Europe, you had the flight of some of the uh, richest members of society did actually go to rural locations. Although this happened a lot less in Egypt, partly due to its geography, than uh, it did in Europe. Uh, you had um, upper echelons of the society temporarily relocating to uh, rural estates. It just didn't work very well in the Middle East because the geography worked against it with a lot of areas being arid um, and uh, a lot of the rural areas being especially susceptible to plague, particularly in Egypt. But uh, that was the kind of reaction you had in Europe. In terms of uh, large top-down uh, government responses, you really didn't get a lot of that.